Well, thanks, Ziggy. Well, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you today. And in the, uh, the few minutes I have, I thought I'd try to frame what I'm going to say with the, um, uh, this, this question, how do you eat an elephant? And the reason I use this is what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is what are the essential elements that you really need to address when you, comp uh, when you try to achieve objectives that uh, address complex problems. So as, as you heard from Ziggy, the, uh, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to fly on the shuttle uh, two times. And I certainly look forward to that uh, from when I was a little kid, when I was eight years old. And I think all astronauts do look forward to that. In fact, here we see the 51L crew. And they were a crew that flew uh, just a couple missions before I did. And they felt the same way. And they understood there were significant risks in doing this. At that time, it was about a 4% chance of a catastrophic failure. But they still wanted to do it, and they were anxious to do so. Unfortunately, you probably know them by a different name, and that is they were the Challenger crew. They were the crew that flew the last Challenger flight. And at the time it happened, everyone thought that there was an explosion, and, and the crew was killed by the explosion. But we saw in just days after the accident, and I was involved in both getting the mission ready to go, as well as the accident investigation, we started finding wreckage that made us understand that it was not blown to smithereens, but in fact, it was an aerodynamic breakup. And as we continued to analyze some of the photogrammetric information, we could see where the crew module actually came, down, came out essentially intact. And I happened to be the one that actually dove and discovered the wreckage of the crew module and the crew remains on the ocean floor, which in fact confirmed that the crew was not killed at the explosion. It was really a breakup, but in fact, died due to impact with the water. This had us immediately start to think about what could we do in the future if we had an accident, which likely would occur because of the risk involved, well, how would we be likely not to have the crew die? So as healthy individuals that are curious often think about, you see a problem, and then you naturally start to think of what is the countermeasure, what would the action take that I would take that would make us successful? So people started to talk about escape pods. And they said, if we had an escape pod, that would work. And there had been aircraft like the F-111 that actually had those, and they worked very successfully. Well, there was another faction that said, let's talk about you know, ejection seats. And we all have probably seen ejection seats on movies or TV newsreels or whatever, and they work very effectively, and they work. But unfortunately, there was this huge discussion for more than a few weeks about which we should do. And this was really a discussion about tactics. And I think what I want to caution you about is, often because we're curious and we think about problem solving, we start going to the solutions before we really thought about the goal. The way to think about the goal, and you want to have a, a clear, concise, compelling goal so everybody can really hew to that North Star for their guidance, you want to say, what should that goal be? And I think about if you have a magic wand and you wave the magic wand, what would you wish for? We wouldn't wish for an escape system. What we'd wish for is crew survival. That's what we want. And that's a very simple thing when you see it say, oh, yeah, that's great. But people didn't think about that right off the bat. If you think about that, then you say, well, what are the requirements? What are the bite-sized pieces that we cut up to, that we are going to have to accomplish in order to get crew survival? And it boiled down to three things. Get clear of the orbiter in flight, reach our surface intact, and then survive until rescue. So we had a very constrained time, less than 24 months. So we said, there are uh, systems that are available. One was called a tractor rocket that we should test. And if we did that, we want to get the crew clear of the orbiter so they wouldn't hit the wing and end up being like a bug on a windshield on a summer day. You know, get them clear. And then we had to test that. So we went out and we had to find a rocket uh, test facility. This was on a mesa near Zion National Park. It was a privately owned one. And we uh, had to get hold of it and be able to use it. We, able to, we were able to prevail on them to let, the, let us use this. We tested the rocket. And in fact, it worked fine and it looked like it would be fine. So then we had to go actually prove it in flight. So we had to have a test bed. So we ended up having to get a plane, had to modify that plane so the side hatch looked like it would on the orbiter and do our testing. Now we got all done that. We were ahead of schedule. Things were looking great. And then uh, I get a call from uh, Admiral Dick Truly, who was the uh, head of uh, space flight at NASA at the time and a, a former astronaut and actually an office mate of mine. And Dick called me up and he said, hey, Jim, Congress is very nervous. You know, you're talking about using a rocket to save the crew, and wasn't it a rocket that caused the problem with the Challenger? And I said, well, Dick, come on, you know that, but this is ridiculous. And he says, I know, but it's a political thing. You have to address it. So we said, what else can we do? There was a, an idea for a pole that you would slide down, and the point was if you came down the pole and had a way to hold on to it, you would still end up in the airstream that would miss the wing and the tail. So we said, all right, let's look at that, though. We didn't have much time. So we went through that, discussed how we do it, and then we had to test it. Well, now we get to the point where we need a bigger airplane. We need a C-141. We didn't have one. We also didn't have the budget for a C-141. But 
I show this picture from a streetcar named Desire, and you see Blanche Dubois, and I always thought of what she said, you know, I always relied on the kindness of strangers. And in fact, this is an important point, because you, if you, don't get, you won't get help if you don't ask people for help and let them know you have a need. So just as we had gotten the ability to use that rocket sled run up on a test facility near Zion, we got these airplanes because we asked different squadron commanders, would you use your training time and funds to fly our test mission? And we finally found one that was able to do that, and he said, I'll do it, but you have to pay for the room and board for the crews. We said, we can afford that. We just can't afford the plane. So here you see the test jumpers. This is the role of morale. The test jumpers are doing a very risky thing. This had never, ever been done, jumping out at these speeds with a pole, et cetera. But they call themselves the pole cats, right? They're jumping on a pole. And their mascot was Garfield. And you see right there, one of the jumpers would always jump with Garfield in the chest strap of his uh, parachute harness, and they would jump it all the time. Well, it's good that they're doing a very risky thing, uh, but yet they still can maintain good morale and good esprit de corps. Don't discount the importance of that. So we did the tests. They worked out great, and we were fine. So now we've figured out two ways to both get clear of the orbiter in flight and reach our surface and attack. The final thing is, how do we survive until rescued? We're going to end up being, if we had to abandon the shuttle, probably in the North Atlantic. The temperature of the water will often be 40 degrees. This is very cold. So we did a number of immersion studies, and here you see me being carried out after one of them, uh, where we did hours of runs where we're immersed in 40 degree water. The important thing here is the issue of leadership. If you're asking a team to do something, you want them to feel a sense of urgency, you want them to be committed, don't ask people to do what you're not willing to do yourself. You need to be the role model. So I ended up doing more runs than anybody else did in the system because I wanted to show that we could do it. Also, it gave me a better understanding of what we were doing. So by doing this, we were successful. We got to fly the mission on time afterwards. Here you see uh, my crew after we flew our first mission. But more than that, it wasn't just getting it done. It was also, I knew it was making it more likely that I would have this scene at the end where I'm picking up my uh, two-year-old daughter at the end of one of the flights. In fact, she graduated from Michigan here three years ago as an engineer. But this is <laughs> so did my other daughter as well. But uh, she was the one who happened to be in the picture. But it enabled us to do that. Now, we talked about healthcare. Uh, these same principles apply to any domain you can think of. In healthcare, some things have changed a lot. This is back in the mid 1800s. You see a famous surgeon, Samuel Gross. Uh, and he's operating much the same way we do today, with an exception. You see, they didn't believe in germ theory that much. <laughs> Nowadays, things haven't changed much. This is an early part of the 20th century. And even to today, things are pretty much the same, except we're more antiseptic. But here's the, here's the issue. About a dozen years ago, the Institute of Medicine uh, came out with a report called To Err is Human. And in this uh, report, they said that there's a major problem that we kill anywhere from 44 to 98,000 people a year during inpatient care due to error. And this is kind of confusing what was going on. Now, at that time, I had already taken, started to form and had formed the National Center for Patient Safety at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And we had said the goal is much different. Don't confuse tactics with goals. What's the goal if we wave the magic wand? The goal is no patient will be inadvertently harmed while under our care. That's what you want to happen. It's not about if people make errors. If people make errors, that's going to happen. That's part of the human condition. However, how do we design our system so if an error is made, it doesn't translate to harm the patient? That's the important point. And that was missed by many. And people for many years, you know, even up through 2005, many people kept saying it was about getting rid of errors. That's a tactic, not a goal. Let me give you an example. Potassium chloride is a very commonly used drug. Uh, probably hundreds of thousands of patients a day get this. In the old days, prior to 2000, and even maybe prior to 2005 in some places, people would ask the nurse, you would write a prescription, and it would say 20 milli equivalents of KCL in a liter of uh, D5 normal or whatever, and the nurse would inject it into the bag so it would be diluted. The reason is you didn't want to inject it into the IV directly. If you did, this is the same drug that is used during executions for capital crimes, right? Potassium chloride, and it would have the same effect in many cases. You would kill the patient. Now, while every nurse understood they didn't want to inject KCL IV directly, occasionally that mistake would be made with the death of the patient. So instead of telling people, let's not make errors, let's not make mistakes, you know, the Nobel Prize winning thought of, let's be careful, instead, we said, how do we design the system? So what we said is, let's make sure when we order the IV bag, it can come up already compounded from the uh, pharmacy 
where it already has the KCL in there diluted. So this can't happen. So there's a way of when you reverse it to, instead of looking at errors, say, how do we get to the goal, which is, is a clear goal, compelling, you know, and concise. That's how we do it. Now, that gets us back to our initial question. How do you eat an elephant? Now, by now, I hope you all know what the answer is, right? The answer is we have a goal that's clear. We have it be concise. We have it be compelling. And then we divide it into bite-sized pieces, right? We do it one bite at a time because any task that you undertake, no matter how big and complex, it finally has to be done by somebody. So you have to get down to that level so they understand how their task actually serves the overall goal. And if you do that, you'll be successful. One final thing, though, you can do all those things. You also have to make it clear to the people participating that it is safe to fail, that if they make a mistake, that they, if, if their plan isn't successful, they have problems, that that happens. And if, if this is about the being compelling in the goal. And the way I put it is, I tell my people, there is no shame in failing while attempting to achieve a worthy goal. The only shame is in not attempting to achieve the worthy goal. And I think if you keep that in your mind, you feel like you're a world beater. You can get things done, and you take this methodical approach. You can be successful doing almost anything. Thank you very much.